Hello cherished viewers, hello lovers, hello dear subscribers, you are welcome to St. Henry's class. It's another day on this channel, we are so much excited and anticipated to always come your way and give you the best. So we go with the slogan, learning for your job steps. Today, let's set the ball rolling. We are still considering our BEC candidates. We have some few days left and we are all praying for you that by the hands of the Lord, you guys will come out successful you'll be successful in your exams you come out with flying colors so we'll do our best to also assist you so you get to your point of getting the best and then coming out with flying colors let's quickly set the ball rolling for some likely social studies questions that can be given to students to answer this year so my team and myself been able to sit down and then compile things together there are some of the topics that are likely to have questions on them. Some topics that are for some time now, Wyatt has not really thrown more light on them. But now, light will be thrown on them, which we are hoping so. Please, there's not any lead paper, there's not any apple as we locally call it. This is our own time, our own sweat. We sat down to study and then to bring out these questions. Not that. We have any leakage. Our channel does not promote that. Yes, it's authentic and genuine. So let's get some likely social. So the first one says that we should state and then state the three types of rainfall. The three types of rainfall. So we know that there are three types of rainfall. That is relief rainfall, cyclonic rainfall, and the convectional rainfall. These are the three main types of rainfall. Now, what is even rainfall? Now, rainfall is the release of condensed water vapor that has evaporated into the atmosphere, which is released as rain or snow or hail or sleet. So, the release of condensed water vapor. Now, there are three ways by which the rainfall is formed that is, relief through relief features such as mountains, cyclonic, that is the meeting of the two air masses and convectional rainfall that is when warm air is forced to rise as a result of convection current yes so as a result of heat these are the three main ways by which next question says that we should examine how any of the three types of rainfall is formed with the aid of a diagram now questions like this demands a descriptive essay and also diagram don't forget, most of these questions carry a lot of marks. The diagram is going to have its marks, and then the essay part will have its marks. So let's deal with all the three. Yes. So let's take the first one, relief rainfall. Relief rainfall. So I'm going to give out the way it is formed, and then the diagram will be drawn on the board. Relief rainfall. Now, this is a type of rainfall that is formed as a result of warm air hitting a mountain hitting a mountain so let's continue now warm air is forced to rise from a water body as a result of evaporation and the warm air hits a mountain or hit a relief feature most specifically highland and is forced to rise up into the as the warm air rises up into the atmosphere, it goes higher, higher, and higher. It cools down and condenses to form cumulus clouds. Further cooling leads to the formation of cumulolimus clouds. When the dark clouds are heavy, they are released as rain. This type of rainfall Mostly is experienced in mountainous areas such as Abetifi and Yosefe, the like. And there is much rainfall on the windward side than the leeward side because the leeward side experiences little or sometimes no rainfall. So let's start diagram for relief. So I think the essay part of the rainfall is placed on the screen there to assist you. 
less than a diagram for relief rainfall. Good. So as we said, the presence of a water body, warm air rising from a water body, heating a mountain. So this will be a high ground. I will call this mountain. And a water body closer to it. We call this C. C. So there's the presence of the sun that heats the water body. Evaporation. Sorry. Evaporation. So warm air is forced to rise. We depict that using our roots. Then it hits the mountain. Hit the mountain, it is deflected to move up into the atmosphere. As it gets into the atmosphere, it cools down and condenses to form clouds. That's simple. Good. Now let's take the next one. Convectional. Convectional rainfall. <clears throat> so, this will also be placed on the screen. So, convectional rainfall is formed as a result of the rising of warm air. Now, as warm as the land is heated, warm air is forced to rise up in the form of evaporation. As a result of evaporation, as warm air rises, it moves into the atmosphere higher, higher, and higher. As it gets into the atmosphere, it cools and condenses to form clouds. Now, further cooling leads to the formation of cumulo nimbus clouds. When the clouds are heavy, they release as rain. This type of rainfall is mostly experienced in the afternoon. So the diagram for site conventional rainfall, sorry. So here the land is heated. The land is heated. So we we'll use this to depict our land. So warm air, the sun heats the land. Can we use arrow to depict the heat of the sun? Good. So warm air is forced to rise up in a process called evaporation or convection current. As it moves higher, it forms clouds. So, rainfall on the land. The last one, cyclonic rainfall. So, cyclonic rainfall. This type of rainfall is formed as a result of the meeting of two air masses at the place called the front. 
Now, two air masses meet at a place called the front. That is warm air and cold air. Due to the lighter weight of the warm air, it is forced to rise up, whereas the cold air is forced to sink. As the warm air rises higher and higher, it cools and condenses to form cumulus clouds, further cooling leads to the formation of cumulonimbus clouds. Cumulonimbus clouds. So when the clouds are heavy, they are released as rain. This rain falls over a wide area and also can last for about a day or two. It mostly comes with thunder and lightning. Okay, so here the land surface, there's a place called the front, the point where the two air masses meet. So let's do a plane to depict the land. Then the slanting line will be the front. So cold air. So warm air because of its lighter weight. Yes, so that is that for rainfall. That is that for rainfall. The three types of rainfall you have them here. The explanation will also be posted there. And then we get it. So let's expect question one rainfall. In fact, the reason I repeated all the theory means that we can't be specific. Any of them can be given to students to answer. Now, C, the next question. State the importance of rainfall to man. Importance of rainfall. Now, one, it serves as a source, rainfall serves as a source of water for domestic purposes, such as cooking, such as bathing, washing, and the like. It also provides water for industrial purposes, as in the preparation of medicine and the like. It also provides water for irrigational purposes. It also provides water for agricultural purposes, or it helps plants to grow well, or helps crops to grow well. It helps to stabilize or neutralize the temperature of the atmosphere. So a point where there will be warm air, too much warmness, uh, rainfall will bring in some coldness of the atmosphere. What else? Rainfall increases the volume of water bodies. Rainfall increases the volume of water bodies. Good. And what also can you also see? Um, we can also add that rainfall provides um, water which are used for other agricultural purposes or other activities or rainfall is harvested, used and used for other activities. These are some importance of rainfall. Now the next question says we should explain the following water pollution, air pollution and land degradation. As the three types of land degradation or environmental degradation, sorry. So what is water pollution? Water pollution is the contamination of water bodies as a result of the release of pollutants such as refuse, such as oil, crude oil, such as solid and liquid waste, such as sewage and the like, which poses threats to our water quality. It asks me to explain, not to just define. So assuming the math they're given is four. You don't only need to define, but give examples, give some activities. In, you can even give some pollutants, as I have just done. So it's quite okay. 
But just to tell us it is a release of pollutants into the water bodies, making it impure. Just that we wouldn't get enough marks for that. Explain. So you need to give us more. So you can start this with water pollution is the contamination of water bodies due to the release of harmful substances or pollutants such as refuse, such as sewage, such as crude oil, solid and liquid waste and the like, which makes it impure for use by humans and other living creatures. The next one is air pollution. Air pollution is the process whereby the quality of the air is reduced or deteriorated due to the release of harmful gases such as sulfur dioxide, such as ammonia gas, such as nitrogen oxide and the like, which sometimes makes breathing very difficult. The next one is land degradation. Land degradation is the destruction, gradual destruction of the quality and quantity of the environment as a result of human activities such as illegal mining, farming, excessive farming, stone quarrying, and the like, which renders the land useless and also unproductive. unproductive. Now, the next one identify two causes and effects each of the three types of environmental degradation. So water, air, land, we should give some causes and effects. So let me start with water. Now, two causes of water pollution. One, improper fishing methods or poor fishing methods. One can be the use of DDT for fishing or fertilizers for fishing. One other cause of water pollution is the release of industrial pollutants into water bodies. So sometimes some industries, after they, they, are, they are done, the unwanted substance that they actually do not have any relevance in, they dispose them or discharge them into water bodies, making it impure and unsafe for aquatic life and human beings. Air pollution, two causes the release of fumes from vehicles, which contains dangerous gases, which, when released, makes the air impure and difficult for breathing. The next one, we can also talk about um, smoking, uh, the smoke from cigarettes also reduces the quality of the air. The next one is land degradation. One, destruction of the vegetation due to activities such as um, legal mining, sizey farming and the like. The next one, we can also talk about illegal mining itself. A unlawful way of extracting minerals from the soil that is also a cause of land degradation. The next one, so cause and effects. So let's give effect of water pollution. One, water pollution can lead to the contamination of waterborne diseases like dysentery, cholera, and the like. It can also destroy aquatic life in the water body. One other effect is that. It can also create a situation of high government expenditure since government will need huge sums of money to treat polluted water. Air pollution, its effects, one effect is that it leads to the contraction of respiratory diseases like um, whooping cough, like um, bronchitis, lung cancer, and the like. It can also um, lead to the destruction of the ozone layer. It can also lead to global warming and the like. It can also disrupt the climatic factors of the atmosphere. The next one is land degradation. One, destruction of the um, vegetative cover of the land due to farming and other activities. The topsoil that contains the required nutrients for plant growth are being destroyed, and this leads to land degradation or making the land useless for other things beneficial agricultural purposes and one other effect is that um, land degradation leaves the land bare which leads to soil erosion 
can also cause what we call drought. Situation where the land loses water, prolonged loss of water in the land, and then the land will grow to have cracks in them. Another effect of land degradation is that um, land degradation makes the soil lose its fertility. I can also say land degradation, one activity such as bush burning can destroy soil living organisms such as termites, millipedes, centipedes, etc. in the land. Those activities contribute greatly to agriculture activities. These are some suggested answers that we can give to this question. The questions are a lot, so that's how we are managing that space. The next question, in what four ways can the environment be protected from degradation? How can we protect the environment from these distractions we've talked about? One, public education on the dangers associated with the activities that destroy the environment. We need to educate people through the media, through NGOs and the like. We need to educate people to stop some of these activities. Because the repercussions will be directed towards us. The next one, we need to ban cigarettes. It's quite unfortunate we are trying to legalize some of them, but we need to ban cigarettes. Seeing the smoke can also destroy the quality of the air. We should also put a ban on the use of DDT for fishing. It destroys aquatic life. We need to conserve aquatic life. We need not to destroy it. We should also practice afforestation and reforestation programs so that we can replace the fell trees with new ones and make the vegetation evergreen. One other way we can protect the environment, or oh, yes, is that we should exhibit or we should adopt proper farming methods. We should, we should do away with the old system, the slash and burn, and then adopt new ways of farming, modern ways of farming. And then we can also talk about burning the use of old cars. Some old cars release a lot of fumes, which destroys the quality of the air. So we should ban such cars from the country. Let's continue. Now explain the following. Irresponsible adolescent behavior. What is irresponsible adolescent behavior? Irresponsible adolescent behavior is the behavior or the act that are unacceptable by a society. In other words, they are the behaviors that do not conform to the norms, accepted norms of the society. That's a simple definition. Behaviors that do not conform to the norms, accepted norms of the society, or acts that are seen as bad and are not accepted in society. Next on the list is chastity. Chastity is a total abstinence from any sexual related activities until one is finally married or until marriage. It is necessary for you to live a chaste life. Abstain from any intercourse, live a chaste life so that one day you can have some dignity or honor from your partner. And also from the society you find yourself in. The next one is reproductive health. Reproductive health is a state of complete physical, mental, and social well being in all matters relating to the reproductive system and to its functions and processes. And to its functions and processes. So we are done with that. Next is what is cultural change? What is cultural change? Cultural change is a shift and adaptation in the social, economic, and general cultural life to be able to cope with the present development. A shift and adaptation of the society means social, cultural. There are state four factors responsible for cultural change. One, education. People are influenced by their culture based on what they have learned. Formal education has introduced new ways of doing things and that affect the lives of the people positively. 
The next one is trade, as people trade or engage in trading, to adopt the cultural aspect of the traders that they meet, and that affects the lives of the people in the city. Now, in trees, um, history that is um, the northern African people during that time during the Trans Saharan trade, they believed that most of these Muslim traders, wherever they went to to sell their goods, they spread Islamic civilization. So, wherever they go there, they try to convert people into their religion. So, as a result of trading activity, they changed them, they, they had to introduce new system, new. Um, cultural system to the people and the people also embraced it. So trade is also one factor. Migration or traveling is also a factor. As people migrate, those that they meet, they try to also adapt their cultural practices and integrate it into this to promote development. Okay, so migration, those that they come across, they try to adapt some of their cultural practices. And also you can see scientific research scientific research so due to the presence of technology and scientific research it has introduced new and modern ways of approaching things other than the other ways as well we used to always attach superstitious belief to things but science has always introduced or always want to bring things that are fact with facts yes that can be proved with facts good so science is also there it has introduced new ways first um, we, we, we need to deliver babies and now the modern ways are there, scientific ways. If the mother comes, then we do have the cesarean session to avoid the inconveniences. And you can also say, um, um, due to, so we are still on that, due to a change in the social environment, yes, change in the social environment, change in the physical environment, conflict or wars, of social upheavals and the like. Now I define the following conflict, conflict management, and conflict prevention. Now in 2018, students were given this question, and according to the um, chief examiner's report, most students, specifically with the conflict management, people, most candidates were not able to give a definite definition. So we'll help you out. Now, conflict, conflict is a disagreement between two or more people or groups which disrupt the peace and stability in a community or a society. That is conflict. Conflict management is the use of various mechanisms, the use of various mechanisms or strategies to reduce the tensions created in an ongoing conflict. Created in an ongoing cause. So here, the conflict is already there. And they are trying to introduce ways of bringing the two groups or the two people down, calming their hearts down. So in the process of the conflict, what are the things you do to bring it down? Conflict management. The use of various mechanisms or strategies to reduce the tension created in an ongoing conflict to facilitate its resolution. The next one is conflict prevention. That is the act of identifying signals of conflict and encouraging the people to work out their differences. Identifying signals of conflict and encouraging the people involved in it to work out their differences. Identifying four sources of conflicts in your community. Here, 2018, the same question. Most students were giving answers that were not required by WIAC. Here, WIAC were trying to was trying to add some causes of conflict, but students of hearing sources thought it was where conflict can occur. If you add source of energy, probably you say sun, you say wind, and uh -huh. So on hearing the source, they thought it was a place where conflict can be experienced. But Wayek wanted causes. <laughs> what brings about causes? Now, what brings about conflict? Sorry. Now, one cause of conflict is um, intolerance. When you reject the views of others, it brings about conflict. Two, infringing on the rights of other people is also one. And then locating a public facility at the wrong place. Unlawful seizure of the property of the family. Yes. Land disputes or territorial border disputes. Chieftaincy disputes, that's the main cause of 
corporate in Ghana, chieftaincy and installment dispute. And then the council talk about suspicion. Most people suspect other people of, of saying bad things about them, so that brings about conflict. We said intolerance. We can also talk about um, greediness. People are greedy. They, they try to get um, some hate from other people and then conflicts can occur. Unacceptable way of choosing leaders. Unacceptable way of choosing leaders. Okay, outline four effects of conflict. Effect of conflict. One, conflict leads to the destruction of lives of victims. It leads to the displacement of people where we have refugees. They are displaced of their home. It also um, undermines development or it brings down development. It does not promote development or growth. It scares foreign investors to invest their resources into the country. It scares foreign investors. We can also talk about it leads to the closure of schools. During conflict, we can't allow students to go to school. Or they wouldn't be safe. Closure of schools. Then what else? We can also talk about um can also talk about um, conflict may also generate hatred among people hatred and outline for attitudes and values needed to prevent conflict attitudes and values needed to prevent conflict so you are talking of some values that you need that will help prevent conflict one having love for one another yes two tolerance tolerance practicing tolerance or tolerance among people Tolerating divergent views. And the next one, we can talk about um, fairness and justice. We should be fair and we apply justice in our dealings so that we don't give wrong ruling to people. Next one, we can also talk about um, that is ways we can, attitudes and values that will help promote tolerance. Humility, yes, when you're humble, then also. Faithfulness or truthfulness or trustworthy as I doubt the spirit of being trusted by people so that will not be suspected. And then what else? We can also talk about um so we talk about respect, love, being tolerant, yes, and the like. Okay. Then define the following a citizen. A citizen is a person who has been accepted as a member of a country legally accepted as a member of a country either by reason of birth, marriage, adoption, or registration or naturalization. Rights. Rights are the benefits and freedoms one enjoys under the 1992 Constitution. <clears throat> Human rights abuse. Human rights abuse refers to the infringement on the rights of an individual which is unlawful in the constitution or which is unacceptable by the constitution. Some also say it is the act of curtailing the rights of people or undermining the rights of people, which goes contrary to the provisions of the constitution. Take for benefits of law and order. So what is law? Law is a set of rules that is established and enforced by authority, legislation, and custom of the given community. Order, on the other hand, is order, on the other hand, it's a situation whereby the people obey the law and follow accepted rules of social conduct or behavior. Then, so let's go to the main question. Sometimes you can also adapt that. Try introducing what you want to talk about. It will also be good. So we give the examiner a fair idea of what you want to talk about. So the next one we'll talk about, so we are still on the question. Benefit of law and order. One, it promotes progress. In what way? Since there's law and there's order, the law will set the guidelines that the country needs to follow in order to promote development. So that's what we follow, we obey it. Our leaders will also be. The situation where we will be, we will be what the law is saying. So we can also say law and order promotes peace. And as law and order, people behave in a certain way, and peace is prevailed in the country. It also promotes stability. 
and show that the peace keeps stand still for a long period of time. Law and order also promotes foreign investments. I've seen there is peace to create conducive environments, an enabling environment for foreign investors to invest their resources into the country. And one last thing, benefit of um, law and order is that law and order, law and order, um, law and order promotes the protection of human rights. Promotes the protection of human rights. Okay, now let's move straight to the next question. Define the following: education. Now, education is sorry. <laughs> Education is the process of learning geared towards assisting an individual to acquire the skills and attitudes in order to improve upon his or her life. Next one is productivity. Productivity simply is defined as the output a man's eye. Also be defined as the measure of goods and services a worker can produce or render within a given period of time. Technology, the application of scientific knowledge and findings to solve human problems. Training, training is a type of education that is geared towards assisting an individual to acquire a particular skill to do a specific job, profession or task. Identify four conditions necessary for economic growth and high productivity. So factors that are necessary measures we can increase productivity. One, remuneration of human resources or workers. Yeah. Two, positive attitudes towards work should be exhibited by workers. Three, there should be proper supervision of workers. Four, there should be the provision of modern technology. Five, the provision of right to, to be used for the right work. Six, we can talk about um, provision of welfare services to workers to boost them to work well, to increase productivity. Then next, I'm going to say training and retraining of staff to update their skills and also provide them with the requisite skills that will be needed to improve productivity. I'm almost coming to the end of the lesson. There are a lot, so we're going to have part one now. Next time we'll have part two and that's the end. So let's take two more questions. Differentiate between public and private enterprises. <clears throat> now, public enterprises are enterprises that are owned, managed, and controlled by the state through act of parliament and also managed by a board of directors and with the aim of rendering services public enterprises and business entity or enterprise that is owned managed and controlled by the state to render services to the country at a minimum cost whilst private enterprises are enterprises that are owned, managed, and controlled by private individuals with the main aim of making profit. Highlight four measures by which entrepreneurs can take to sustain their businesses. So, what are not the measures that entrepreneurs can take to sustain their businesses? One, we can talk about the provision of quality goods. So, if you're an entrepreneur, you want your business to sustain, be there for a longer period of time. You produce quality goods or render quality service to people. Two, you should also train your workers, train and retrain. So, training and retraining of workers. So, some of these workers will engage your customers, and then they need to have the requisite skills, the ways of dealing with customers. They know how to even speak to them, how to attract buyers. They need to know these things. So, you need to train and retrain your workers. In order for them to acquire the needed skills that will help them to sustain their business. The next one, you should also motivate your workers. Yes, if you don't motivate your workers, your business cannot stand. So they work well to the effectiveness of the enterprise. So there should be the 
motivation of the workers in your enterprise. And the last one that the entrepreneur can do to sustain their business is to invest larger capitals into their business. Invest larger capitals. So their business will grow, yes. They need to invest more so they also receive more. Investing huge cap capitals into the business. And then we can also talk about um, organizing periodic education programs or yes, educational programs as to how they can sustain their businesses. They should be organizing programs, symposia lectures. They should also be visiting some of these symposia lectures that are geared towards helping businesses so they can get new business ideas and strategies to keep their business booming and also working for a longer period of time. So this is where we bring the first edition of Social Studies Life in Question to an end. We come to where we part two. We always promise you we'll bring you the best and the best. Stay tuned for more. If not subscribed, please do so. Our VC candidates, don't panic. We will assist you, we will help each other, so we know you are the future leaders of our tomorrow. So we do our best to assist you. Thank you for having me, and thank you for watching me. This is Sir Henry the Humble Tutor, and I'm out. Bye bye.